I'm afraid that you'll just have to tell my words instead. Uh, so apologies for that. Uh, so my name is Chris Atkinson. I work for C2C. I have worked for C2C for just approaching four years now. Uh, I'm the communications and stakeholder manager, which is a very long-winded way of saying I'm the person, I'm the PR guy, I'm the person who talks to local community groups, local MPs, local councils and anyone else who needs some special attention. Uh, for some reason, I'm the version of special attention. But thank you very much for inviting me here today and for lunch as well, an uh, absolute pleasure. I've got some information about the history of the line and some information about the future of the line. Um, obviously, as a local group, I know a lot of you know C2C and our route. I won't dwell too long on that. Uh, we, we have been around, and I use we in the railway term rather than in the corporate. Term. We have been around for, oh, quick bit of maths, 162 years now, 1850s. Uh, an Act of Parliament, because that's why things were done in those days to um, start building. An Act of Parliament was passed to build a railway uh, which would go to Tilbury from uh, Fenchurch Street and Bishop's Gate, um, which was a station back in that day. It extended throughout the 1850s on to uh, what we called Horndon at the time, and we now call Stanford La Hope. Um, Lee in 1855, down to South End 1856. Um, about 25, 30 years later, the railway was growing in popularity. Obviously, the East End and South End in particular um, was a destination that people suddenly could access and enjoyed accessing. Uh, the Pixie Direct route, as they call it, um, we tend to actually say the main line today, um, was opened in the 1880s. So the railway came to Upminster, 1885. It was then expanded to East Horndon, which by some geographical uh, <laughs> miracle is now West Horndon. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> That's what they think of West Horndon. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, and the line that connected through to Pitsea, 1888, uh, onto Shoebury also in the 1880s as well. Um, that's the structure of the line we know it today. However, some things have changed. Uh, Basildon, for example, uh, opened in 1974. Uh, until then, we used Langdon since the town was built in the 60s. Uh, Chafford 100, once the Lakeside Shopping Centre opened about 1990 or so, I think. The station followed a couple of years later. 1993, um, and West Ham Station, it was on the original line, it then became part of what we now call the district line, um, until 1994 when a couple of platforms were stuck on a bridge, and it's now our second busiest station, um, so we try and cope on some very small, very compact area. I've got some lovely old pictures here, but again, they're, they're lovely, take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really nice. Uh, so, when the line was first built, is the London Tilbury and South End Railway. Um, that was the private company that built it in the first place, but in the early years of the railways, plenty of mergers, change. It wasn't long before the, uh, we became part of the Midland Railway, because obviously it feels very much like the Midlands here. Um, <laughs> and in the era, era of the Big Four, um, the famous rail companies of the sort of 1920s and pre war era. Um, yes, we were London, Midland and Scottish Railway um, and we were talking briefly about war memorials um, at lunch and we don't actually have a war memorial on the C2C route as we know it today. Uh, all of our <coughs> fallen from uh, the First Second World War are remembered and they're on a memorial in Derby because that was the headquarters at the time of the company we were then part of. Uh, it's obviously quite a trek. We've done something now to um, a book of remembrance on our website basically and we may well see if we can put that to rights um, in the next few years. Uh, nationalisation, British Rail, you may remember it. So 1948 to the mid-1990s, um, C2C uh, as we know it today was part of British Rail, 
uh, London South East, I think, was the um, area that it became part of. Um, and then in the 1990s, reprivatisation came along. A company called Prism called us LTS Whale, um, returning back to the historic name it first started with. Um, and then National Express, a current owning company, my bosses, the company I work for, so the good guys, um, <laughs> they bought the company out in the year 2000 and introduced the name C2C in 2003. And since then, we've been called C2C. Um, and now the government has said in our latest franchise that evermore this part of the route will continue to operate under the name C2C. So that's settled until the next time we change. Um, in terms of what C2C means, uh, it gets asked quite a lot. There isn't really an answer. Um, so we go with some people say it means city to coast, which would make sense. Some people say it's about commitment to customers because at one point some bright spark in the internal comms used that as a tagline. Um, some people point out that the original chairman when it was launched, uh, his daughter was called Charlotte and his son was called Charles, um, and it was his gift to them that he named the company after that. The answer is we don't really know, um, but it's our name and we're sticking with it. So. Yeah, been there, done uh, that. Charlotte, she's, uh, she, she's almost retired now, so uh, she, she's getting older. Um, the Wizardry line, again, a subject that came up at dinner. Sorry, it must be when I turn and says my. I think it may be your watch, is actually. <coughs> Oh, I wish I electric got... watch. Have you got something electric in it? Oh, I'll take my phones out of my pockets. I'll take my watch off as well, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I always know I wouldn't sign if I go on too long and get ketchup thrown at me. So, <laughs> uh, so the, the misery line uh, is what certainly the route was known at in, in the early 90s, late British Railway era. Um, hopefully not too recently, much beyond that. Uh, reputation that the route had and deserved if you've travelled on it in those times, but one that I think we've overcome since. Uh, certainly back in around 2000, we only had 88% of our trains on time and 63% passenger satisfaction. Uh, that was in the days of the old slammed door trains where you'd be able to hop out halfway down the platform whilst it was still arriving in, or indeed if you missed it, jump on if you timed it well, or um, if you didn't time it well, it's your own fault. Um, <laughs> new sitting work, a uh, lot of work with RailTrack now, Network Rail, therefore to actually run the infrastructure, the track itself, the signaling equipment, um, the level crossings. Between us, we've managed to sort things out. We've got what we still do refer to as new trains, they're actually about 15 years old now. Um, so they're teenagers, really. Uh, they're about halfway through their working life, we'd expect. Um, but those trains, very reliable. We know which bit of them to hit with which spanner. Um, and I said, I obviously don't know, but clever people at the depot do. Um, and so nowadays we're over 97% in terms of punctuality, which we always like to point out is most in the country, better than the Swiss, uh, better than the German average. It doesn't actually beat the Japanese, but yeah, we'll, we'll target it, we'll get there eventually. Um, and passenger satisfaction as well now, 89%. So we more the kind of numbers that I can stand here and <coughs> slightly boast about um, compared to a decade or two ago. So uh, National Express, as I said, is the company that owns C2C and uh, 15 months ago now, November 2014, yes, 15 months ago, uh, won a new franchise uh, to last for 15 years. So National Express and C2C as the company stands today, we know we're around for 15 years, well, 14 and a half, 13 and a half now, so clock's ticking. Uh, but it's not many companies that can say they've got a guaranteed contract for that particular length of time. Um, it's very good and that enables us to invest a lot of money up front, try and do a lot of things very quickly, um, and therefore we're able to bring around quite a bit of change and improvement, we hope, and then sit back and carry on that investment, carry on the dividends for the rest of the franchise with if we do all the hard work up front, we get the benefits in early and people can enjoy them better. Um, so there's various things we're looking to do. Capacity and trains is um, the first area I was going to highlight. And some of you may be aware we had a new timetable that started yeah. in <laughs> mid-December. If you are aware, you may be aware that we're not quite there yet. Good. 
might be how I put it. Uh, the intention, brand new timetable, it added a total of 1,400 more seats at peak times. That should sort us out for the next three years in terms of providing extra capacity. And it has provided more capacity, but we've also found the extra people very, very quickly. And it's not really lasted three weeks, to be honest. Um, so I wouldn't say back to the drawing board, but we've got a lot of people working very hard at the moment to sort these issues out. We have some new trains which are going to be arriving in the next few weeks, uh, month, six weeks or so. Um, we hadn't been intended to have any new trains till 2019. But basically, we've got what's on the market. Uh, we're looking at what else is going to come up later this year so we can get those trains in as well and get some extra seats, extra capacity. We're at maximum frequency now. Uh, the signal as it stands, we do 20 trains an hour um, in, in most of the peak, and that's as many as we can fit in a train every three minutes. So what we're going to keep doing is lengthen the trains, make them longer, add extra carriages, make every eight car, 12 car of time. Uh, so extra, my, my original slides about additive capacity used to be different a couple of months ago, uh, but now it's all about finding trains PDQ to help make sure that the journeys are working. Um, and as I say, we've got new trains due to arrive uh, three years time. May well be that they end up coming sooner than that. Uh, still got to build them, of course, but it's an area of change for us at the moment. Our trains as well, they're all undergoing a refurbishment. Um, they're getting, so it's a clean, <coughs> contemporary and stylish interior. Um, so I think that means that they change the seat colour. Um, <laughs> and we lay the flooring and those part of that as well. Uh, new lighting, LED lighting, very energy efficient. Um, £12 million programme, nothing comes cheap in the railway industry. It's one of the first things you learn. If you think that should cost X amount, add a couple of zeros on the end um, and then double it. Um, and then we need to think back into C after that. But that's our 12 income programme for trains. <coughs> I've got some before and after pictures here. Again, the after is much better. <laughs> um, before is a bit green, after is a bit pink. Uh, the C to C smart card. Now, in an area like this, um, I know that a lot of you will be used to using your Oyster card. Um, and indeed, a lot of the time, that's probably all you do need to use. If I were three or four miles, perhaps, further east, um, I'll be talking to a lot of people who know all about the Oyster card and are fuming about the fact that it's a London product and doesn't quite stretch out to the journeys they want to do. Um, but the C2C smart card is essentially our answer to the Oyster card. It is the same principle, a card, you load up your ticket, you tap, you go through the gates, works in the same way, but it goes all the way out through Essex. And all the train operators in the South East are bit by bit um, getting these new smart cards and soon you'll be able to do things like you'll be able to go south end down to Brighton, for example, on one electronic smart card ticket. Now, a smart card is good because your paper ticket no longer rips. If you lose it, we just cancel it electronically and give you a new one. Um, you don't have to worry about when it goes through the gate so many times and it stops working because it just goes deep on it. Uh, so it's a nice and modern from that way, but it also allows us to do some real exciting new things. Uh, most important of which, automatic delay repay. Uh, from, and I think this may well be next month now, certainly within a couple of months, we'll be offering, when our trains are two minutes delayed or more, we'll be offering people some money back when they've got a season ticket with us. You need a smart card, because we need to know who you are, when you tapped in, when you tapped out, and therefore what train you were on. Uh, if you're two minutes delayed, we'll give you 3p. If you're three minutes delayed, we'll give you 6p. Then goes 9, 12, you can see how it, how it works out. I won't go on like that, we don't have quite that amount of time. Um, but that's money where, at the moment, no one in the industry offers you anything below half an hour's delay. If you're half an hour delayed, you'll get 50% of the money back from us. That's pretty standard. But you get to do it automatically with a smart card. You don't have to fill in the form each time. Um, you don't have to find it, post it, wait for the vouchers to arrive, you then need to exchange for tickets. It all builds up as a credit in your account. Um, so it's the future, but it actually is within weeks of being the present to the current. Um, and if you think a season ticket holder, the train might be delayed, well, it'll probably end up being delayed by a couple of minutes or more, two or three times a week. You may get a five, ten minute delay, hopefully just once a week. Once a month you get a nasty one, 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, because it does happen sometimes. Add it all up at the end of the year, that's 
probably going to come to 40, 50, 60 quid of your ticket maybe, um, and that will certainly be next year's ticket price wise. So in a way, it keeps your ticket held down going forward at the same rate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other things we're doing with new tickets, um, the senior waiver fare. I did wonder if that might be of interest to the women. <laughs> I, I will admit that in advance. 65 plus um, for this ticket, so it's not for everyone, I know. Um, but for Mountminster, £5 flat weight, you can go anywhere you like, Mountminster, Eastwoods, on C to C, get up as many times as you want within a day. Um, if you're wanting to go further to London on it as well, it's £9, but the same principle, waiver ticket. And that's been probably our most successful new ticket that we've offered um, since we started the new franchise. Because uh, £5 and you have a full day out in S6 and then we'll still get it back home if we go and get the ticket as well. So if you haven't used it, I do recommend it. Uh, advanced tip discounts, if you're travelling with those who are under 65 but you're travelling off peak, um, we'll, we do 40% discounts, um, up to 40% up to 48 hours in advance. So, Book your ticket, say I'm travelling this day. You don't have to name the train. We don't do sea reservations in the same way that Virgin or the other long distance people do. Um, but that'll give you money off. And indeed, in January, it's 50%. So you're going to be a salesman too. If you buy quick, you get a bigger discount. I'll just let you know that. Uh, flexible season tickets as well. Um, things have very much changed, particularly in recent years. The season ticket makes great sense if you go to work five days a week. Um, if you travel four days a week, it's probably the most convenient ticket, but not quite the cheapest. If you do three days a week, then you have to buy three lots of daily tickets um, each week. They probably go down on a Sunday, make a special trip to the station to do it, so you don't have to queue on Monday morning. Uh, flexible season tickets are going to work on the carnet principle, if you're familiar with that. You get to book a ten tickets, basically. It's, again, it's electronic, it's on the smart card, it's fancy, but it's discount tickets. It gives you cheaper value if you're travelling at peak time, um, and you, but you don't work every day. They're starting in the summer, and that's going to be one of the big things that we do that's different. Um, and we know that the rail industry doesn't always have the best reputation for uh, transparency and simple systems that you can understand, and is it the super off-peak weekend rover you want, or is it the day special annual ticket? It, it gets very complicated, and we know that. Um, so we do a double the difference offer. Basically, if we sell you the one ticket, it isn't the cheapest one you could have had, you get your money back and you get it again. It kind of takes the John Lewis principle um, and then doubles it, is how I like to think of it, in terms of the refund we offer. A couple more things I'll just dwell on whilst I'm not having catch up thrown my way. Uh, station <laughs> improvements. Uh, I said numbers are big railway industry. £33 million pounds we're spending on our 26 stations. Um, over the next three years. Uh, Fenchurch Street, Barking, they're going to be very big projects. But first of all, we'll be at Minster. Um, and in particular, if you know the car park um, entrance, the side one rather than the top one, um, that's where we're going to start with our new um, smart station scheme, game smart, it's a word we obviously throw at everything. Um, it's about improving the layout of the station, more ticket machines, more opportunities to buy things, um, more funky walls with video screens where you touch on screen and it does this, that and the other. But if you want to buy it up a person, it's got the person too, is the key part of it. Um, we now staff all of our stations throughout from first to last train. That's something we started last September. So there's always someone there. There's someone in the ticket hall to sell you your ticket. Um, it may be they press the buttons for you, it may be they just sell it to you in a good old fashioned way if that's what you want. Um, but also we have that presence at the stations now, so some of our smaller stations, um, you get to uh, early afternoon, around, around about this time, they'd start posing. No one there in the evening peak, no one there at night when it's later, darker. If you're travelling on your own, you may feel a bit vulnerable. Now we've got to start at our stations throughout um, to make sure there's that reassurance. Someone there to answer your questions, and more importantly, someone there so you don't feel quite so alone. And whilst I'm talking about the security side of things, um, the police. We have bought our own police team. That sounds slightly one slightly suspect. It's not quite how I mean it. Um, but we now have a dedicated team on the CTC route, four police officers. Um, it allows them to, to provide an intelligence-led approach. So it's good we've got intelligence in our policing now as opposed to the uh, previous approach. Um, 
But really, that's about knowing the local area, knowing your beat. It takes the principle of the community cop on the beat, but applies it to our railway line because it's small enough for you to get to know the stations, the staff, and indeed some of the regulars as a policeman you do need to know. Um, and it means that we can get them out and about late night on more of our trains and our security belts as well. Um, so those are some key things I wanted to dwell on for now and for the future, um, plus lots of the pictures. But please, if anyone does have any questions, I will do my best, I think. Small station, mm. um, whereas in the old times when I used to travel on it, you got it held up outside and everything was held up. Can that be overcome? Well, the, the, not, not easily, I think is probably the answer to that, and not quickly. Um, we are two truck railway all the way into Fenchurch right Street. Through, yeah. Right at the very end, it's been attached to the four platforms. Um, but there's little prospect of that particular part of the layout changing anytime soon. The land's quite expensive now in the city of London. If, we, if we'd had it in the 1850s and they thought ahead for us, we'd have been okay. But that's not likely to change. What might be able to change, and indeed this is a five to ten year probably horizon, is some of the clever new signaling gizmos that Network Rail are working on. Um, in essence, using the principles of GPS, on board the train to run the trains closer together. So rather than going for from red light to red light whilst the train ahead of you clears the line, um, instead you can bunch them up much more closely and therefore you'd be less delayed um, waiting behind a slow train in front. Platforms wise so we've got four of them up Fenchet Street, we'd love to have more. I doubt I'll, I'll be standing up anytime soon and see <coughs> news about that to be honest. I heard that with the uh, uh, move from West Ham from um, the current ground to the stadium in Stratford, uh, that there's a possibility of trains direct from Upminster through to uh, Stratford uh, at weekends or when there's matches on. Is that, is that, is that being planned? Yeah, that, that, that's not only planned, that actually happens now. That's one of the three parts of the new timetable that is working well and we're happy with at the moment. Uh, so, nowadays there's a half hourly direct train from Upminster at weekends goes to Stratford and then on into Liverpool Street. Um, and that is permanent apart from when there's engineering work and so we're going back into French Street as normal. Um, so, yeah, two trains an hour do that route and that is intended to be the case going forward. And yes, when West Ham leave, we can now probably be very popular. At the moment they're full of shoppers, but soon be full of football fans and shoppers. So you're all right for your matches, Keith? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can I ask one thing more? You go to Elm Park, Upney, West Ham, you've only got two platforms. Or you did have, I don't know what's happened since. Well, and they were both for the district line. Yeah, we, we only stop at West Ham, we don't do Elm Park or Upney on our services. Um, I think, <coughs> some, certainly Hornchurch, I think, is one, isn't it, where there's almost the ghost platforms are and, uh, cordoned off now because they're not used. <coughs> I don't think we're going to s start stopping um, at any more district line platforms anytime soon because we're <coughs> quite full going through London already. Um, so I suspect that probably won't be changing soon. Yes, what is the interface with Crossway? There isn't a direct one. Uh, the closest you would get, well, there's a couple of options. The closest you would get, I, I tell you, it's this light, that's part of the problem. We're going to stand over here, sorry. Um, from Woodgrange Park, you, which is on the London Overground Line from Barking, there's an interface from Crossrail. Uh, the Jubilee Line at West Ham, you can then interface with Crossrail. Um, French Street in the city, I'm trying to think where the closest city stop and cross rail will be. I think it's at Liverpool Street, so I walk up. So we don't have direct interface with it. I think what we're expecting when cross rail launches is Shenfield, for example, is going to become a bit of a honeypot place in the way that Upminster is for us at the moment. People drive there 
get on at the start of the line, in the case of course, they'll get themselves a seat and head in from there. So it will change some dynamics. It may well mean fewer people choose from, from north of C to C and south of um, Great Anglia and Crossrail or TfL Rail. It will be more people start to go over to Crossrail than come to us when that launches, perhaps. We don't quite know. We watch with interest. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think they're being very, very polite in telling us about uh, smart cards and oyster cards because I think if you look around most of us, it's freedom passes. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted to ask if we got a rebate for train delays on freedom passes. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that bothers me sometimes is school holidays because although some of us have grandchildren, um, some of us also travelled to London during that period. And very often there are only four carriages, and it means an awful lot of people are standing. And I wondered why, uh, whether you check the number of people that travel during school holidays, um, and why you can't put more eight carriages in the on. So what we normally do, we do always track when school holidays are, um, I'm normal approach is we will lengthen the first trains after the morning peak for people going up as day trippers um, and then likewise in the late afternoon coming back home again. So there's getting the cheap ticket, first cheap ticket, going up to town for the day. Uh, I think it's a fair point that we do always need to monitor who's getting on because trains are getting busy all the time. Um, my colleagues in the death row uh, my colleagues in the depot don't tend to like letting the trades out. They'd much rather keep them in and keep their mileage down and work on them during the day. But frankly, we can get more out when the demand justifies it. I think school holidays is the kind of time where we increasingly be running more, more the trains will be running longer than all. In the past, we've only done the first two or three trains. We've increased that out to the first hour and a half. They get to the stage when it becomes simplest for us to do it. So what sort of time would you run those? longer trains after the rush hour? So the first trains even South End would be nine, so coming up to this end of the line, getting on, if you think, uh, 9.45 to 11, that kind of window. So they're the ones where we tend to have, by default, longer trains. After 11 o'clock, though, if, if demand justifies this, and I think we look and learn each time, then it may well be that we do do more. I, think, I can see it's something we may well do more often in the future for long day in the day. Brian? Yeah. Um, I, I'm aware that uh, CCC is very conscious of keeping us older people healthy. Um, I just wonder if, if that was the reason that when the trains stop out at the station, when they come from Fenchurch Street, they tend to it's stop halfway to the next yeah. station. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there must be an explanation for why you set this target for us to reach the steps. I was wondering, is it a technical problem or is it just that you're being bloody <laughs> <laughs> um, It's because it's, it's a nice run in and they get a good bit of speed up and then we'll try and break as soon as possible. <laughs> so that, that is, I am told we're very close to that mill being the case. So get your exercise whilst you can. And I'm so looking forward to when, the time when that's resolved, which I'm, should be a few months. The reason why it happens is uh, we have equipment which drivers use to check where the train, where the train is free behind them. Um, now I say equipment, most of the time it's a mirror. There's a couple of mirrors with angles on it. Um, and the mirrors that are in place, they, we, put them, we have four carriage trains, eight carriage trains, 12 carriage trains. At Arminster, when you're going down to South End, obviously the stairs are right at the back. So if you're a four carriage train, you want to stop nice and close, and we have some mirrors there. If you're an eight carriage train, you can't stop there because half the train's out the platform. So you have to go on. However, where we would naturally put the mirrors, part of the canopy is in the way, basically. Um, so instead they go onto the 12 carriage mark, which is more or less the end of the platform, where it's nice and clear and the driver can see his mirror, but everyone's got to walk up 200 metres to get back to the stairs, at least. So as a problem, absolutely. As a solution, we're upgrading from mirrors to cameras. So that, that is a couple of... I think it was originally going to be done by the end of last year, and it hasn't been, but months away from being resolved. Orientation or reassurance. Yes. Just assume the driver didn't know what they were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jim, and then...
Uh, just one comment. Um, I, I actually like your. I, I compliment the <coughs> C2C on the quality of the service. Yeah. It, it's extremely yeah. good. There's no two ways about it. Detail. On the in the mornings, I you go to London, and I tend to catch train leaving just after nine o'clock from Upminster. All of a sudden, that's dropped down from an eight carriage to a four carriage. I used to get a seat on there. So did most people. Now I haven't got a cat in hell's chance. Where's the benefit to me? Okay. On that particular train, at that particular time, if it's gone from eight to four, no, there isn't much benefit to you. I completely understand that. The way the timetable has worked is we're running more trains, but at the moment we only have the same number of actual carriages to do that. So some we're working the fleet harder. It goes in and out more times to do more journeys. But that does mean that some of the trains are four carriage train where there may have been an eight before because the gap until the next train is less of a gap. So your overall carriages in an hour mm -hmm. is more. Your number of carriages at the 903 or whichever particular time may well be less at that window because the other four carriages are on the new train that never used to exist <coughs> later. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to people already being on it, one of the things we found with the new timetable, it was always intended that we would have people travelling longer more than on the seat, so fewer empty seats, um, certainly into You've the You've achieved that very well. So, indeed, exactly. We've filled them up. We have more than filled them up. We've seen huge growth, um, taking us by surprise, which is why we need to buy more trains. So, yeah, that, that, that's our solution to it, is to get more rolling stock so we have fewer shorter trains. Mm -hmm. okay. We have two, two more. George first, and then Ron, and then we have to fill them. Oh, 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 so for Arminster specifically, or well, you know, Rumford has got a problem. Three two three. Three two three. That has been blocked. And one of my very close friends who used to use that place to go to hospital had a lot of difficulties too. That's not C two C, sir. Not their line. Uh, uh, no. Arminster has it apart from actually the line that then goes to Romford, um, so the Pushpool yeah. line. And actually, there isn't a lift on that platform. And at the moment, we don't have money to solve that. So we're going, we're applying to the industry fund to say, can you give us some money to build a lift there? Um, almost all of our, no, 23, I think, of our 26 stations are accessible at the moment. Uh, the ones that are left over are the hard ones um, that weren't cheap to do. Um, but we are going to be making all of them accessible in the next, it's probably five to ten years for some of the hardest ones in terms of lifts. Okay, is. The other yeah. thing we're just looking at trying to do, by the way, is um, from platforms, if you know on the tube line you have the raised level on the platform, mm -hmm. in particular by where you then sort of have level access onto the tube, and that's something that we're going to trial as well. None of the national rail companies do that at the moment, but we've said we're going to have a go to see if we can do that at every platform as well, so that we can then, you don't have someone with a ramp to help you, you can just have a access yourself. George? Um, it's, it's a bit almost like Subash mentioned. Um, I need to take my daughter to the O2 uh, about a year ago, and of course you haven't got wheelchair access from the platform onto the train. But the personal service that we got um, by informing the station that we were travelling on a train um, was fantastic. A guy came round, put the ramp up, wheeled us in, travelled with us to West Ham and saw us off the train. It was, it was fantastic. So uh, one thing compensated for the other. Thank you for that. I mean, that personal service at the moment, uh, we tried, I'm, I'm glad it worked, excellent, um, and it works very much a lot of the time, but not every time, which is frankly not good enough because it should work every time anyway. Um, but we're trying to take that personal service from the stage where, to guarantee it, if, if anyone with accessibility problems comes to the station, we'll try and get you on the next train. Um, if you do book ahead four hours, we will guarantee there'll be someone there to get you on the next train. And we're trying to move that from guaranteeing that for four hours to just guaranteeing that for walk-up, that we will be able to help. 
we're not quite able to make that pledge yet, but that's what we want to be able to do. What, Ron, this is the very last question. Ron, okay. um, you used to share the station, Upland Association with British Rail, but I understand that you now have control of it. Does that mean maintenance of the control of the complete station in the Emirates? Uh, yes, it all comes. We have now, have now a 99 year lease, um, which means all the stuff is our responsibility except for actually building it. Um, and so the entire station, uh, plus we also have the uh, signal box centre at the end of the car park. Um, they're still, the chief have their little depot bit just off to one corner, which isn't ours, but the actual station itself is ours to maintain and upgrade, um, just not to. We can't build new bridges or anything like that, but redecorating the house and maintaining the house approach, that's our responsibility. Right, well, hopefully now to uh, mm. thank Chris for coming. I think it was a most interesting talk. Yeah. Yeah, very and also, uh, yeah. congratulating on uh, the way in which he answered most loosely the questions you put to him, I think. But he obviously knows C2C. Uh, it was yeah. interesting to know yeah. some of the things about BBC where he worked beforehand. But congratulations, and would you please give a little appreciation. Thank you very much. The um, menu for next week is minestrone soup, followed by fish pie.